Welcome to everyone. How are you all feeling today? Yeah, you see, the last few months I've been feeling a bit of an oppressive sort of feeling from you. But today it's not so oppressive. So that's interesting, isn't it? So why is that? You're feeling a bit lighter. Some of you are feeling a bit lighter. How many of you so far have been along to Mary's workshops? Yeah. Mm, okay. <laughs> um, how, so um, there's still, I think, there's a good, I think we've still got nearly 200 people to go uh, with the workshop. So, um, and Mary, in her last workshop, who was in the last workshop? So there's a few, yeah. Yeah, she's really refined things a fair bit by the time she got the last workshop. So you've probably got the best one of the lot at this point. <laughs> and, uh, and what we're finding is that's helping a lot of people starting to open up quite a lot. Um, last week, myself and Mary, after Mary did the <coughs> workshop on the weekend, on Monday morning we left here and we went down to Coffs Harbour. And on Tuesday evening uh, we had a, a chat with a group of people there. There were about 90 people there. And, uh, and then uh, and, and there's a good uh, 50 or 60 of those who want to get, have a workshop happening down there. So that's something that we'll be uh, trying to sort out over the coming months. And then we went across to uh, Armadale, um, in between Armadale and Tamworth. There's some friends of ours there that have a sheep station and uh, a house big enough to fit around 40 people or so in. And so we had a chat there. And that was Thursday night. And then we drove home or back here to the Sunshine Coast Friday. So yesterday we got back here about six-ish and, uh, and now we're doing this weekend and then our plans after that uh, are to head home for two days we get home <laughs> and then we come back uh, to catch a plane down to Melbourne where next weekend we'll be down in Melbourne and doing two, uh, besides going to a friend's engagement party, doing uh, two uh, seminars down there on the Sunday and the Monday nights and then coming back home. Now I've also just, I thought a bit of housekeeping we need to handle and that is uh, I have actually, I am actually going to cancel the next seminars here in Butterham and I think that was for the 12th or something like that. Maybe Mayor if you can help me out with some of these dates. Um, <laughs> What we're going to do instead is we're going to, Mary is going to be doing a workshop uh, on a fo the following weekend, which I think is June the 16th to the 18th or something like that. And um, on that weekend on the Sunday, I'm going to do a Sunday afternoon presentation in Brisbane, so at, uh, at the Bracken Ridge venue. Um, and so before then we're going to cancel the, the stuff here. Because what myself and Mary would like to do is condense a lot of the work we do travelling because at the moment we're having a day here and two days there home, uh, which means that everything at home is becoming worse and worse <laughs> in terms of uh, maintenance and everything. And, uh, and we're also not getting as much time, obviously, with each other uh, to work through some of the things that are coming up for us. And, and uh, Mary's going through soulmate stuff and I'm going through unworthiness stuff at the moment. And, and as a result of that, um, we're not getting enough time to do our own processing work. So, so what we've decided to do is actually have a period where we come, we travel for a period which is basically two weekends and a bit of extra time in between. And then the rest of the time we spend home uh, dealing with our stuff and then come away again for a, a period of time other, rather than doing what we're doing at the moment, which is since January we've only been home, well there, there's only been one occasion when we've been home more than one week, so um, it's getting a bit difficult for us to get some processing of our own done. Um, today the subject that I have chosen um, for your consideration is this. It's part of the Human Soul series. Um, of talks and I've, I'm calling it Processing Addictions. Tomorrow the talk will be part of the Relationship of, with God series and it will be called Faith for those of you who are wondering what is on tomorrow. But today I'd like to talk to you about 
um, not only your addictions, but how to actually confront them and get through them and, uh, and out of them, which is probably the more important thing to discuss than actually the addictions themselves. You remember a few months ago, uh, for those of you who were present there, I did a talk called Expectations and Addictions. You could think of this as the second one of this series about expectations and addictions. So let's look at addictions firstly as a bit of a revision about what an addiction is and what an addiction does to you. When we're little, we have emotional, what I've been causing, call, calling causal emotions enter us. Now, something like a causal emotion might be something like, um, no one loves me, a feeling that no one loves you. No one cares for me, I'm uncared for, I'm unloved, I'm unwanted, I'm not approved of, I'm not accepted. These are all fairly deep causal emotions within us. But for the majority of us, what we finish up, and you could say basically, um, just as an aside, you could say these type of emotions are emotions of how I feel about me. So in other words, most of the really darkest, deepest emotions within us that we're going to need to process at some point are related to how I actually feel about myself. And, uh, and how I feel about myself, I finish up usually projecting onto my environment in some way if I don't resolve these negative feelings that I have about myself inside of myself. So causal emotions in the end a lot of times get to how I feel about me, how I deal with the issues that I have within myself about myself. Of course, we also have a whole group of emotions related to that about how we feel about others and how we treat others. But many of, much of how we feel about others and how we treat others comes firstly from how we finish up treating ourselves before we even meet them. And uh, so, so if I have a feeling inside of myself, for example, that I am unworthy to have money being spent on myself, so let's say I have that emotion. In other words, as a part of my law of attraction with that emotion, there'll be a group of a lack of abundance type things happening in my life. So I'm not going to have much personal abundance. I won't have much funds. And so as a part of that emotion, because I feel that I can't spend money on myself, I can't look after myself, I feel unworthy in fact to be looked after, I'm attracting a lack of abundance in my life so that's how I feel about myself. But how does that get projected on the environment is I finish up saying when I notice somebody spending a lot of money, I zero in on them. Who's that? That's, there's one there. She spends a lot of money, I know. There's another one I think he spends a lot of money. You know, so we go in like that and we, and we zero in on those people and we judge them because we're already in this space ourselves of I'm not allowed to spend money on myself so why should anybody be allowed to spend money on themselves? Can you see the relationship? So a lot of times we finish up projecting how I feel about myself onto my environment. So they are causal emotions. But the problem with these causal emotions is they are so dark, they are so deep within us, they, they feel so hard to feel that I don't want to feel them. And so what I do, even as a child, and, and, and of course our parents of course don't want to, us to feel them either, so as a child we start cre creating a heap of blockages to feeling these emotions. So mum yells at me for taking five cents out of her purse when I was three years old, right? And she's really upset about that, not because it's five cents, but because I stole from her, right? And so she tells me all these bad things about myself. You know, you're just a bad boy, you, you know. And, you, and so right at that moment, I'm getting from her a heap of emotions that I'm terrible, I'm bad, I'm shameful and all those kind of things. Those things are entering me. Now under normal circumstances, a child getting this barrage of emotion from its parent would immediately cry because, it, because they're just openly vulnerable to their emotion. So under normal circumstances, they'd immediately go into tears and crying about how bad they feel. But mum then on top of that says, you cry about this and I'll give you something to cry about. 
right? So now we've got, right at that three-year-old experience, a block created, right? A block to actually feeling the underlying causal emotion. The child is no longer able to feel what it really feels about itself in that particular moment because the parent is now threatening it with further violence, which then shuts down the child even further. And so therefore we now have a layer, if you like, of blockages that are on this causal emotion. And these layer of blockages are mostly fear related. They are fears. So for example, in the example that I gave, what's the child afraid of? It's afraid of the pain of crying. Like, it's not crying that's painful, it's the threat of the violence if they cry. And the threat of the violence if they cry is worse to them than the actual crying. And so what do they do? They shut down because of the potential pain involved. So we become so afraid and this is where a lot of our fears come. So before then, the child knows that it can cope with its own emotion automatically. Do you ever see a baby at uh, you know, this age, like less than six months or old or whatever, going to you and saying, oh, I don't know if I can feel that because I don't know if I'll cope with it. <laughs> like, of course not, right? The, the child doesn't even think of that because it hasn't developed its brain yet anyway. But, but it just goes ahead and feels what it feels, doesn't it? Right in that moment, whatever that, whatever that is. And it doesn't analyse it in any way. And so the child is actually totally capable of experiencing all of its own emotion. Totally capable. Every single one of its own emotions it's able to feel. And it does feel naturally without our help. We don't need to take it along to a course to help it to feel its emotion, <laughs> do we? Can you imagine the ludicrous feeling? Oh, my three-month-old three child can't cry. I need to take it along to a <laughs> therapist to help it cry. And, and you see, this is what happens, is that the child knows how to do these things automatically. That's how God created us. That's the beauty of how God created us, is that how we were naturally created automatically happens from the moment that we arrive. However, because of these parental blockages and everything that gets piled on the child, by the time the child's two or three years of age, the child now is shut down in a lot of different areas. And these shutdowns weren't originally of their own making. Can you see that? They were really of the, the, they were created by the environment and the child absorbed the needs of the environment and conformed itself to that environment. Does that make sense? So the child felt the fears of its environment and then automatically started adjusting its behaviour to suit the environment. Now, the fears of the environment then became its own fears as the result. So now the child itself is in this place where the child is shut down quite a lot emotionally already. Now, the problem is though, this child continues to grow and continues to change, continues to have life experiences, and as that growth continues, the child is experiencing more and more of a shut down emotional environment, shut down people, shut down belief systems, not allowed to express myself without getting some kind of form of punishment or, or lack of love. There's no unconditional love in my environment. And so as the child grows up, it starts learning that there are things that it can do to get certain things fulfilled. So the causal emotion might be, I don't feel like somebody loves me. That's the causal emotion. This really dark, hopeless feeling that for some reason nobody loves me. Right? It's a very dark emotion. And instead of feeling that emotion, because it's not allowed to as a child feel it, it, it because of the blockages that the parents are, and the environment have placed upon it, it then now go. it still wants the feeling. It still wants the feeling of being loved. So how does it go about getting it? It learns what we have all learnt, and that is to barter one thing for another thing. So in other words, I learn to earn the love that I want, rather than it just be given to me as a gift, because I'm not getting the love as a gift anywhere on the planet hardly, and so what I, what I need to do now is start earning it. So I learn that there's a cost associated that I pay and then the other person will give me the thing that I want. Right? 
it sounds like our financial system, does it not? Which, can you see, is basically based around the same emotional premise. I have to pay, you know, the whole user pays capital system is all based around, there's no such thing as gifts. Everyone has to earn their way into whatever it is. So, like, God's given us a planet where we've got huge amounts of available water for us to drink. But what have we learnt to do with this? What man does is he grabs that and turns this into a user pay system. There's so much lack of love on this planet that you've even got to pay for your drinking water. Something that within a few days, if you don't have it, you'll die. That's how much lack of love there is here. If, if there was more love, all of us would be able to have water for free because that's what God gave, all the water for free. So there's no need for us to have to pay for it, but we've set up this system because we've got this belief right from our, from our environment that we have to pay for anything that we want. And we've learnt that we have to pay for love. That's what we've learnt. And in the process of learning to have to pay for love, we have become addictive people. We've set up what is called codependence. Right? If I want to be loved, I've got to earn it from you. And then, if you think about it, that means that I've got to do what you want. And that will be earning it from you. And when I earn that from you, then you'll give me the love that I need for myself, that, I feel, that makes me feel good. And if I can't earn it from you, then I'll go to another person and try to earn it from them. <laughs> And, or from them, or from them. And, and so we finish up having a lot of these, and in fact, almost every relationship at some point in our lives before we recognise these truths is actually codependent and addictive. Now at the soul level, it's even worse than that. Because at the soul level, this emotion of how I feel about myself is being emanated out into the universe at every single moment that I don't actually want to feel it. So I don't want to feel my causal emotion, which is how unloved I was from my mother, let's say. So I have a causal emotion inside of me that I feel terribly unloved by my mother. This emotion I don't want to feel, and my mum didn't even want me to feel it, so she shut it down in me as well. And by the time I'm an adult now, I'm now not wanting to feel this terrible unloved feeling that I have, but it's coming out of me. It's like coming out the pheromones of your skin, basically, but it's actually from your soul. It's like this, this pervasive, uh, invisible, but you know, something you can feel coming from a person, but it's invisible, coming out of them, enveloping every single person in their environment. So if I'm in this place myself, where I'm feeling unloved by my mother, coming out of me to every single person in this audience is... I am unloved by my mother. I feel unloved by my mother. But I'm not feeling it. I don't, I don't want to feel it. That's why it's coming out of me. Because I don't want to personally feel it and just cry and release it inside of myself. So it comes out of me. And out of me comes with it this demand that every woman in my environment loves me. Because that's the, that's the feeling I have. I'm not loved by the woman and out of me comes this feeling that I've got to be loved by the woman before I'll in even inter interaction with them. So lo and behold, three or four different types of women come up to me and I start talking to them and I think these are just normal interactions, like normal day-to-day -day interactions, but actually they're not. They're actually interactions based on the soul demand inside of myself that a woman loves me. And these women have a feeling that they've got to love the male to get something from the male. So they have a reciprocal addiction, a codependent addiction. And these women just hone in on me because I've got the, um, the opposite addiction that's acceptable to them. And before we know it, we're entering relationships without even, even knowing why we're entering them. And we feel very attracted to these people. And most of the time we feel very attracted because we're actually in this codependent relationship with them where I, what's coming out of me gets satisfied by them and what's coming out of them gets satisfied by me. And so now we're in a very satisfactory relationship. I really like that person because 
of this codependent addiction. But this person over here, who doesn't supply the codependent addiction that I'm looking for, I think she's a bitch. <laughs> right? This woman's fine, this woman's a bitch. You know, I just can't get along with her because my codependent addiction and hers are incompatible with each other. Now you see, when you get to a place where you love everyone, do you think you'll be thinking some people are bitch and some people aren't? Well, obviously not. You'll love everyone and you'll feel a strong, passionate like, feeling for that, like, for that, in that loving space. So you won't feel like this woman's a bitch. Even if she has emotional injuries and everything, and even if she's yelling at you, you won't feel like, oh, she's a bitch. You will actually feel a feeling of love for her. But you see, that's not what's happening because most of the time what's happening is I'm very focused on how I feel about myself. And so therefore what I'm doing is I'm focusing in on myself, feeling like anybody who satisfies an emotion inside of me is a person that I'll get along with. Everybody who doesn't satisfy an emotion inside of me in some way, I can't get along with. And it sets up this codependent, addictive world that we live in. So much so that, and to be frank with you, it, it does create the emotion that you've got to pay for your water, believe it or not. Right, right down to that level, it creates all of this physical environment that we live in, thinking that we've got to live in it, but in reality we don't. We, we could easily give it all up, but only by dealing with our codependent addictions. So that's why it's quite important to understand. So here I am, I'm in this space, so if you could think of it, here's me, here's, here's my physical body, but reality that's not me, is it? And here's my spirit body, but that's not me either. The real thing that this is coming from is my half of the soul. This is the real me, my half of the soul. And out of the real me comes these emotions that I am un now, as an adult, unwilling to feel. So I'm unwilling to feel that, these, that women don't love me, that my mother didn't love me. And so I, I totally detune from that. I don't want to feel mum did not love me. Because if you feel mum doesn't love you, gee, that's a pretty confronting emotion when you think about it. If your mum can't love you, who can? Right? Now the truth is that, you know, that, that, that if your mum can't love you, it doesn't mean other people can't. But there's a feeling in us that if our, our own mother who brought us into the world can't love us, then... Nobody can. So we don't even want to know that mum doesn't love us. <laughs> we don't even want to feel that at all. But because it's inside of us, it's an emotion coming out of us constantly in every interaction with every woman on the planet. And by the way, not just on the planet. It's an emotional interaction with every spirit who's a woman who has yet to deal with her codependent addictions as well. So there's just so many people that are going to be attracted to me to help me feel that they, they are going to be the woman who loves me. Right. And while they're going to be the woman who loves me, so here's the woman on the other end with her, of course, her spirit body and her physical body, which really are just vehicles by which her soul is going to express itself. While I'm projecting that out, this woman, any woman who's going to be attracted to me is going to be attracted to making the unloved man feel loved. She's going to just feel like, oh, I'm just so attracted to this man. He's so beautiful. He's so, like, she, she'll just feel that inside of herself. And it won't be for any other reason than having a codependent addiction within herself being met at the same time. So the problem we have on earth is that almost all of our lives are spent meeting the emotional demands of the emotions we personally ourselves are unwilling to feel. So I'm unwilling to feel that my mum doesn't love me and out of me comes a demand if to any woman, you've got to love me and, and any woman who feels like she's got to love the man in order to get one of her codependent addictions met will be invited into that, into that interaction. Now. That's what I would call an addiction. So you know what people call an addiction? They say, oh, well, you know, people are addicted to drugs or people are addicted to alcohol or people are addicted to TV watching or people are addicted to movies or people are addicted to sports or high adrenaline, you know, active uh, sports, for example. People are addicted to all these different things. Every single one of those physical addictions comes from an emotional place. And it starts with an emotional addiction not being met. 
So what will happen with physical addictions is we create this life where we're now blocked down to our causal emotions. We don't want to feel our causal emotions. And so what we now want is we want our environment to satisfy the unfelt demands, the unfelt causal emotional demands. So my causal emotional demand is please love me. If you're a woman, please love me. That's my emotion. Because I, because I have this feeling that I'm not loved by women inside of me, then the, 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 plea going, the plea going out to the universe is please love me. Any woman out there, please, any woman out there, please love me, you know, is really what's coming from my soul. Does that make sense? And as that's coming out of my soul, any woman who goes, yeah, I love you, yeah, you know, she'll be attracted to that because of something inside of her soul. Right? And so I'm now expecting, I have an expectation, this is an expectation that is placed upon my environment to meet my unhealed emotional need. Does that follow with everyone? I'm projecting out to my environment that you've got to meet my unhealed emotional need. If I heal this emotional need, will I have it being projected out to the environment anymore? No, I won't. Right? But I don't want to heal it because I don't want to feel it because it feels too painful. That's what I think. So it feels too painful. And my parents, through this blocking and suppressing process, told me it's too painful. They told me that I'd never be able to cope with it. They taught me that I won't be able to cope with it. And so they suppressed it as well. You know, they, they couldn't cope with their own. <laughs> so of course they believe that you're not going to be able to cope with yours. So they suppress all that, keep that all under control. And so what coming out of me then is I want my environment to meet the unhealed emotion. And that's the addiction. I want the environment to meet my unhealed emotion. Now how do I know I have an addiction? Well, whenever my unhealed emotion doesn't get met, when I have an addiction, I will always get angry or hurt. Right? So that's a measure of how we have an addiction. So, you know, every time you've got angry, it's because one of your addictions has not been met. Does that make sense to everyone? Every time you felt hurt inside of you, it is because one of your addictions has not been met. And if you can trace the addiction down, you will find under it a causal emotion which, which you are wanting to avoid in that moment. You'll always find that. If we can have a mic. Yeah. Uh, we need to use the mics because otherwise they don't get recorded. How do you get to that causal emotion? Like what I'm going to do is describe that. Okay. process, right? But, but, but firstly we have to understand the process in the sense of like feel what the process and how it began inside of us before we can start settling with things. You see more, normally what we do in the addiction is the, un, the addiction doesn't get met and what we automatically go into rage or anger or resentment or hurt. We automatically go there. We don't, we don't go, oh hang on a sec, I'm feeling this hurt, anger, rage, whatever it is, so therefore I have an unmet addiction and therefore I need to look at what that addiction is. What, what, are, what is my expectation that's driving this addiction and go deeper? We'll talk about the process more in a minute. The main thing is to understand what's going on inside of ourselves, firstly. Does that make sense? We have a microphone back here. Um, AJ, um, when you're talking about that unlovable emotion, because I've got that, mm -hmm. and you're saying that we attract people who want to love us because they've got codependent um, addiction, I thought that we attracted people who don't love us. I thought that's my experience a lot of the time. Well, so I'm a bit confused. Yeah, and I'll talk about this with you in more detail because what we do is we initially enter an attraction thinking this person will love us. Does that make sense? And that person enters the attra same attraction thinking they're going to get from you what they're going to get as well. This is why most of our relationships have that initial what we would call honeymoon period. Right? So that's the initial part of the attraction. The initial part of the attraction happens and we're not aware of what's going on generally. So the initial part of the attraction happens which is this honeymoon period where we both think yeah this is going to be a great 
for both of us, right? Ten days later, we're now having our doubts because there's all these other things that are hooking into us through these addictions. And this is why addictive things never become satisfying in the end. And, and what we need to realise is that actually nothing is going to be satisfying until we deal with this unhealed causal emotion. But we don't believe that because we've been taught differently. And so what we do is we go along trying to get this addiction satisfied. We finish up having the initial honeymoon period of, ah, yes. And sometimes the honeymoon period in the spirit world lasts for 50 years or 100 years. It can last a long time until one person changes. And as soon as one person changes, what happens to the other person? If the other person gets angry or upset in any way, then that's telling you, well, we had an addiction going on here. Now, some of your addictions are so dependent on each other that you love giving it. And this is the problem, is that many times we love giving the addictive thing in order to get the addiction met. And we can enter very, very strong and powerful addictive relationships through our desires to have the addiction fulfilled. And we can remain in those relationships for many years, thinking they are a happy relationship even. And in reality, all it is is a codependent addiction. And the test of it is when one person begins to change. Does the other person still love? And does the person who's changing still love, for that matter? Both of them, obviously, would still need to have love. And you can leave a relationship but still love the person. Right? And uh, obviously, we need to look at that if we can't. So, so, so the initial honeymoon period is usually because of the addictive behaviour, and then, then the addictive behaviour attracts a person who also has their own addictions, but eventually they become oppressive. The addictive behaviours all become oppressive at some point in the future. And so you end up finishing up fighting about it, you go through a power phase of the relationship where each person is trying to get power over the other, and, and then that doesn't work because whenever you're in a power uh, struggle, obviously that's not love either. And so eventually what happens is the relationship sort of goes apart and we feel the rejection of it. And the, the, the truth is it needed to be rejected out of our lives, a relationship like that, because it, it was a codependent addiction. But, but we often go down the track ourselves of going, yeah, he was very addictive, <laughs> or she was very this, or he was very that. Not, not me, not I was, whatever, not I was generating this in some way. And that's where... With our addictions, this is what we do. You think of what happens with a person who's addicted to a substance. Because there are many co like there are many things that are very similar to a person addicted to a substance, of course, as there are addicted to an emotion. Now let's look what happens with a person addicted to a substance. Let's say the substance is alcohol. So what happens initially is they're not an alcoholic, what we would call an alcoholic. They, they, through some, usually some trauma that occurs in their life, sometimes when they're young and sometimes when they're adult, adult, there's some kind of emotional thing that enters them that they can't, that they feel they will not be able to cope with feeling. And so what they do is they have a drink. So it might be a bit of stress in their life, so they have one drink. And what do you do when you have one drink? That alcohol starts going into your mind and affecting the brain, you get a slightly euphoric feeling. Oh, that feels really nice. Boy, euphoria is a good feeling. I haven't had that for 20 years. Um, another drink wouldn't go astray, right? So you have another drink. And oh, a bit more euphoric feeling uh, going on. Like, so yeah, no, this, feel, this is feeling really good now. I feel a bit spaced out, you know, don't have to worry about my life now. So I've now gotten rid of, you know, a lot of the seeming problems of my life have now disappeared because I'm just not conscious of them because I'm in this phase that's manufactured but I'm feeling this euphoria. So I'm feeling euphoria and then somebody takes away my third drink and says, no, you're not having any more. That, what does the average person do under those circumstances? Straight away there is some aggression, isn't it, usually? What do you mean? You're controlling me. You, how dare you do that? I'm all right, I'm fine. Right? Now if you have a person who's in a pattern of addiction to alcohol, you try taking away their bottle. Like they have bottles hidden all over the place, don't they? Just in case somebody comes along and takes away one, right? Um, who's seen the movie Pay It Forward? You remember at the beginning, the lady, you know, in this addiction with alcohol, and oh, 
just all sorts of hidden places that the child knew everywhere <laughs> mum was hiding her stuff. But that's what we do because you take away the thing we're addicted to and generally we go into this place of anger or rage or at least hurt, we at least feel hurt. Now that's because we have the expectation, see that's not how you spell expectation either, <laughs> as you all know probably. Um, you have the expectation that the environment fulfill your unmet emotional addiction. Now the problem with this is, is, is immense when you think about it on the planet. Because it's everything that I believe that I cannot actually feel myself, every single thing that I believe I cannot feel myself, I will expect someone in my environment to fulfill. Now, as soon as I expect you to fulfill something that's, an, something that's unmet inside of myself, I am going to have an expectation or requirement placed upon you. And any time I do that, I am being unloving. Even if that requirement is for you to be loving, I'm unloving. Right? Because in the end, we want to get to a stage inside of ourselves where it doesn't matter how any person on this planet including your partner, your child, your mother, your father, your workmates, colleagues, uh, employer, all of those different people. It doesn't matter to us how any of them treat me because I'm in a state where I'm going to own my own emotions about everything. I, have, I actually have the power to feel everything inside of myself because remember I said at the beginning, a little three-month-old child has exactly the same power doesn't. The little three-month child doesn't have to be educated about how to feel its emotion. Right? So therefore it makes sense that I must somehow inside of me have been designed to be able to feel all of my emotion. Which means I'm able to feel all of my hurts, my causal emotion, my, all the stuff that's inside of me. I am able to feel. I do not need really another person on this planet to fulfill any of those unmet emotions. I don't need that to occur. So when I don't feel it, my environment gets the projection and because everyone in my environment also has very similar damages in different areas, they then project at me whether they're going to fulfil my emotion or not. They're going to stay in this interaction with me or not depending on their unmet emotional needs and whether I meet theirs. And so every relationship becomes very, very conditional. Every relationship becomes a bartering system. I'm going to talk to them as long as they make me feel this way, make me feel that way, make me feel this way, then they're nice. And if they make me feel bad and they make me feel angry and they make me feel upset and they hurt me, then they're not nice. And we create this separation. All the people who make me feel nice are over in this group. They're the ones who I spend most of my life with. And all the people over in this group, which keep getting attracted to me at some point through my life, I hate their guts and I try to reject them on every possible opportunity. Right? And if that whole group happens to be a nation because I'm a racist and they don't meet one of my addictive needs about my race, I'll even do it to the whole nation. And I'll even get out a gun and shoot as many of that nation in order to meet my addiction. That's how powerful these addictions are. They create a world which we're willing to even kill each other to meet our addictions. And anyone who doesn't meet my addiction gets destroyed in the process. That's how powerful these addictions are. Now, if I, if I think of it that way, then I can see that it's very important for me to look at dealing with my addictions. Can you see that? It's very important as a part of my spiritual journey to actually get to the point where I'm not intellectually skipping over addiction, when I'm not making out I don't have them, but rather that they actually have gone from within me. Because remember I said to you, whether I'm intellectually conscious or aware that these interactions are happening or not, every unhealed causal emotion inside of me creates the addictive behaviour. This is why people tell you you have a subconscious mind. Right? 
Because everything you don't want to feel creates your life often. And then they say, oh, it must have been my subconscious mind that created that. No, it's actually something you can be completely conscious about that created that, which is your own feeling inside of yourself from your childhood that you did not want to feel. That's what created it. And if we can see that as, if we want to use the same terminology, that is our unconscious mind, if you like, our subconscious mind, generating a lot of our interactions and generating our law of attraction. So here I am sitting in these addictions. And maybe what we need to do is look at how it happens in practice and just so that we can feel a bit more about how it works. You see, most of us initially, when we start talking about addictions, people go, oh, I'm not addicted to drugs, I'm not addicted to alcohol, I'm not addicted to you know, any substance really, I'm not, oh, I'm free of addictions. Now, if we'd use the terminology that I've just used and the description that I've just used with regard to addictions, how many of you are actually free of addictions? It's not. It's very hard to be free of an addiction, isn't it, under that definition. And if you can think of every physical addiction as just when the emotional addiction does not get met. So the problem with most of us is that we are meeting our emotional addictions in, many of, in, in much of our life, right? Because of that, we have a less likelihood to have a physical addiction. So actually, the people with physical addictions are just demonstrating that their emotional addictions aren't even getting met. You follow that? And, and in reality, if a person has a physical addiction, often they can more rapidly access the emotional addiction that's not being met because it's obvious to everyone around them that something's wrong. You see, the problem for the majority of us is my emotional get, addictions get met by you, your emotional addictions get met by me. We're both happy. We don't see that there's a problem here. But when we look at a guy who's you know, bonged out on drugs for half of his life, we say, yeah, there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, yet, and yet, myself, I myself, I'm happy, and so I think there's no problem. But in reality, the problem is that his emotional addiction isn't getting met. That's why he's on these drugs, because he needs a physical way of getting out of these emotional addictions. And that's quite obvious. But the problem for me is, I'm already getting my emotional addictions met, and I'm quite happy with it. And that's not obvious. And can you see sometimes it's actually harder for a person who's getting their emotional addictions met and who feels quite happy in their life to progress spiritually towards God than it is for the person who's down and out and has a lot of problems in their life getting these addictions met. Does that make sense? And quite often it's not so obvious. In the first century, Many of the people who followed us when we were travelling around talking to people like we are doing these groups, many of the people who followed us were actually people who had heavy physical addictions. Right? Because they could see they had a problem. Right? And many of the people who attacked us were the people who were in heavy denial of their emotional addictions because they couldn't even see they had a problem. And this is the trouble with emotional addiction, is that often we do not even see the problem that's right there. And we don't see our rage and our anger and our hurts as proof that the addiction is present. <coughs> and we just don't notice those things. And if we're in a very, very close codependent relationship with somebody, we can often avoid much of the rest of the pain because there's seemingly so much joy in that relationship that we don't even notice why that relationship was created. We feel this relationship is beautiful when in reality it's so codependent that it just makes both of us, both of us extremely happy because we're getting our addictions met. So for most of us, our emotional addictions are getting met. So we don't have to go to a physical addiction to detune from our life, 
to detune from the fact that things are not being met. We go to a physical addiction generally when the emotional addiction doesn't get met and we don't know how to meet it. That's often when we choose a physical addiction. Whatever that physical addiction be, it might be drugs, alcohol, it might be medicated prescription drugs, it might be painkillers, it might be TV, videos, movies, it might be partying every night, having sex all the time. Like, not that there's any trouble with having sex all the time or partying every night. The issue is, are we using it as an addiction to suppress a causal emotion that we had drawn up down there? That's the issue. So the emotional addiction, when it's met, doesn't generally generate a physical addiction. When it's not met, then we get the additional layer of a physical addiction. The beauty of a physical addiction, though, is it's obvious usually to everyone around us and sometimes to ourselves, not all the time, but it's obvious generally to everyone around us that we have a quotation marks, problem, right? But the, the issue with this side is that it's not obvious to anyone around us that we have a problem, except generally to God and your relationship with God, because while you're in emotional addictions, you cannot get closer to God. So obviously these talks are all about being closer to God, so we want to be able to learn how to deal with the addictions, learn how to you know, feel about them and do something with them. So let's uh, look at some of that. But before we proceed, is everyone clear about the addictions? Like, is there any questions you'd like to ask about this? Can you have the mic just... If you can keep your hands up, ladies, just... A uh, question is, is it possible that you're having an emotional addiction, you're aware of it, mm -hmm. by, uh, for example, my response, which is usually anger or... Um, frustration, I'm knowing it's my reaction, I'm owning it, mm -hmm. but I can't seem to um, get a sense or an understanding of what's causing it. Sorry. <laughs> so then, what do we do with that? What like, do we do with the is fact? Is that possible that you can actually be aware that it, it is, there's something going on? Of course. Remember, one of the, when, what I said, the, the basic form of awareness is if I am angry, <coughs> frustrated, annoyed, feel hurt, about something else that someone else is doing or something yeah. that's happened, then I am in a, my addiction is not being met. So, so the first level of consciousness, if you could say, about addictions is to notice mm -hmm. when the, the behaviour you have is when your addiction isn't being met. Yep. And we'll talk more about how to get down deeper, but, but that's the first level of consciousness about your addictions. In that space, you know whatever it is is that is driving you is out of harmony with love. You know that. Because yeah. you're angry, you're upset, or you're hurt. And all of those things are not love. Like if you're in a love space, you'll feel blissful, happy, joyful, and all those emotions, not the other emotions. So, so instead of condemning ourselves for our state, what we need to do is notice, firstly. Mm -hmm. Ah, I'm angry, I have an addiction. Who knows what it is? I don't know what it is at this point, maybe, right? Yeah. But at least I know I have one. <laughs> That's the first step with all of this, like, to know that you have one. So, so one of the first things you can do, and we'll talk more about what you can do, one of the first things you can do is start writing down everything that makes you angry. Okay. Because everything that makes you angry covers over an, an addiction somewhere inside of you. Everything that makes you feel frustrated, write that down. And that covers over an addiction somewhere. We don't have to know the addiction yet. The point is, is becoming consciously aware inside of ourselves that, yes, my anger, my hurt emotions, my frustration, my annoyance and all those emotions, they obviously are covering over a demand that I have inside of me. Something's going on here. And you'll be surprised a lot of times it's big emotions, but we'll talk more about that in a minute, about how to get deeper. The main thing is under, understand the first point of awareness is your initial rage, anger or hurt response. That's the first point of knowing that something's wrong. Yeah. And once you're at that point, you know uh, another addiction here. Yeah. And to be frank with you, I've had thousands of them to work my way through. So the majority of pe persons on the planet have a good thousand or two of these addictions right, to work their way through. <laughs> that didn't make you feel very good. <laughs> There's another one of those addictions, see? Did you just feel that addiction? 
Did you feel that addiction? I'm serious. Did you feel that addiction that you just had? When I made that statement of truth, the, the, did you feel the level of joy? <laughs> you know, like down like that. There's the addiction. Can you see the feeling of, oh no, what's that? Frustration. Oh no. There's the addiction. What was that addiction? The addiction that I cheer you up. That's the addiction. You want me to say things that are not true so you feel good about yourself. That's an addiction. Does that make sense? Even that one statement that we have often a thousand or two addictions to deal with causes us to actually get into one of our addictions. <laughs> Could, just along that line, question is, um, okay, we have thousands of these addictions to get through and that's fine. Mm -hmm. My question is, is this lifetime like to get through the addictions? Because I'm kind of thinking if everybody's got all these addictions and you get through your addictions, how do you exist with the rest of the planet well, the, or everyone on it? Well, the, the beauty is how you exist with the rest of the planet is very easily because, because you don't respond to anybody's addictions anymore okay. and you've got no addictions coming out of you that they have to respond to. So everyone around you actually feels better in your company. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the people who don't feel better are the ones who wanted you to supply their addiction <laughs> and they leave you because they want to find a person who will supply their addiction. So your life actually becomes very simple. You don't believe that, <laughs> but it does. Like it does become very simple. You'd be surprised how simple it becomes. We'll talk more about this aspect of how simple your life becomes when you deal with these things. Because, because there are, there, while I say there are thousands of addictions that, we, that the average person has, the truth is that there are usually only 30 or 40 core emotions that drive them. Does that make sense? <laughs> See, did you feel that again? I said 30 or 40 core emotions and, and what? Uh, I've got 30. Uh, you know. There's the addiction again. See? Can you see the addiction at play? The addiction. Oh, no. Yeah. Now, now, when you think about it, the majority of you come along here not because I sweet talk you, right? And that, that's, that's, a, that's a beautiful thing, actually, because that, show, that t t tells you that you are not wanting to have your addictions met all the time now. You want to start dealing with the real stuff. You see, just the fact that you're attracted to come to a place where a guy gets up and tells you a truth that you don't want to hear, <laughs> but you'd feel drawn to come back next week, <laughs> means that there's something that appeals to you in the soul about living in this space. Does that make sense? So that there's obviously some truth going on in there, having its positive effect in amongst all of that. But the truth really is that we often have 40 or 50 core emotions driving the majority of our addictions, and we might have thousands of addictions as a result of those core emotions. And every core emotion has its unique flavours based upon our life and how it was created. So, and we'll talk about how that all happens in a minute. So the answer to the question is, firstly, notice every time you have that deflated feeling that you just had when I said the truth. Every time you notice that deflation, every time you notice that the joy can't be maintained, every time you notice there's anger, frustration, annoyance, any of those hurt-based emotions, I know an addiction is not being met. And if I have courage, if I follow this addiction down the rabbit hole, I will actually pick out the causal emotion. I'll get there with it if I have the courage to actually acknowledge the addiction exists. Does that make sense? And, the, uh, use and the beginning would be writing it down. Writing the, down the beginning is always feelings. becoming consciously aware that this is happening through your emotions. So your emotion is anger, frustration, annoyance, deflation, all of those type of emotions. There's an addiction not being met. Oh, straight away. Oh, addiction. I've got to write down the circumstances in which this happened. Oh, today the circumstance that it happened was that AJ told me a truth <laughs> that made me feel like, oh, I've got a lot of work to do. That, and that truth, no, so he, I would have be liked him to tell me that actually in 10 minutes' time all of you are going to become at one with God. <laughs> uh, that, that sounds really good, doesn't it? Uh, woo, that's really cool. You know, that's a, uh, that, but it's not true, right? So that's the problem with that kind of thing is that, and this is the trouble of what we've done, you see, is we're so used to hearing like sweet platitudes because of our addictions. 
we want to actually get somebody cheering us up because we want to avoid the emotion of how we really feel, which is, well, I don't feel that happy about myself, really, and I need someone to cheer me up in order to make myself feel happy about myself. Does that make sense? And so I'm doing is avoiding of how unhappy I feel about myself, really, in that moment. If I can allow myself to go, oh, okay, right at that moment, yes, AJ said that, and, and, and to be frank with you, it doesn't even matter whether I lied to you or not. Right? Now, now don't go and quote that out of context. Because <laughs> what I'm saying is, although I want to tell you the truth, even if you're lied to by somebody and it makes your energy goes down, there's addiction. There's an addiction in play inside of you. Do, do you understand? All you need to do, you, do, you don't even need to worry about what the external environment is really doing to handle these things. All you need to do is feel your own emotional response to what the external environment is doing. That's all you need to do and you know straight away whether there's an addiction in play or not. You don't even have to have somebody come along and tell you anymore. All you do is feel your own emotion. Oh yeah, like he yelled and screamed at me and I felt terrible. Wow, what's the addiction? Because do you think when you're at one with God and somebody yells and screams at you, you're going to feel terrible? I don't know yet. <laughs> you don't know yet. <laughs> well, let, let me think. How many of you have yelled and screamed at God at this point? It's probably about 80% of the group. So let's multiply that by the world's population. So of the six, billion and half, six and a half billion people on the planet, we can basically assume in any one given period of, say, a few months, uh, that, that a good 95% of the world population, or 80% of the world population is yelling at God. Can we assume that? Okay, so, there's, so at the moment, right on the earth, let's say there's 4.8 billion people yelling at God. Does it make God unhappy? No. Why? Because God is not a dick to you either yelling at him or not yelling at him. Do you get that? Now, if you're at one with God, would you be addicted to anyone yelling at you or not yelling at you? Of course you wouldn't. Does that make sense? So somebody can come along and yell at you when you're at one with God and you won't feel bad. You won't feel negative. You won't feel scared. You won't feel afraid. You won't feel like bopping the person in the nose, any of those things, you won't feel it because you're at one with God and you have the same emotional response in that you're not addicted to the person treating you a certain way. You don't need it from them anymore. Does that make sense to you? So when I ask the question, does God get addicted to what you want? Of course God doesn't. So is God sad when you yell at him? No, he's not. So that means when you're at one with God, when your partner yells at you, are you going to be sad? No, you're not. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> you won't even feel the emotion of sadness in you when your partner yells at you anymore, when you're at one with God. Now, the fact that I do, at this moment, feel sad when somebody yells at me means that I am addicted to something coming from them. And I can feel that emotionally. I can do something with that emotionally. So the people around you don't even have to treat you nice for you to be able to see what your addictions are. Huh? The beauty of that is you can be in any interaction on this planet and find out what your addictions are. Right? It's a very powerful tool to see where you're out of harmony with God and bring yourself into harmony. Can you see that? Very powerful tool. It's wonderful. It's a fast track way of facing the causal emotion within yourself. But we've got to not judge the addiction. The problem, the problem for many of us, we, we look at a guy who's drugged out in his head, right? Drugged out of his brain. We go, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a sad thing to see that, you know? And we start having a lot of judgment inside of ourselves about it, don't we often? We go, oh, look at that. Look at the damage he's doing to his life. And, Damage he's doing to everyone's life. And, and we don't see that I'm emotionally addicted and what about all the damage that that's happening there in my life? I don't know, none of that's... But you see, we look at the damage in the, in the drug, you, drugged out person's life and we can see the results of the addiction a lot more easily than we can see when we're in an emotional addiction. But the truth is that we are not right now at one with God because of our addictions. 
because our addictions are what we use to cover over the emotions that we're not yet prepared to feel. So it's because of our addictions that we're not coming face to face with our causal emotion. While I get my addiction met from you, do you think I am going to feel what I need to feel while you're giving me what I want? It's very hard, isn't it? Like, if, if, give an example. If a man's addicted to sex, this is a physical example. If a man's addicted to sex, and his wife gives him sex every single day, maybe four or five times a day if that's what he needs, right? Is he going to be a happy man or a sad man? He's going to be a very happy man. <laughs> because his addiction is being met perfectly. Can you see that? His addiction is being met perfectly and so he is going to be happy. But do you think he's going to be happy on the day she wants to take off? Is he going to be happy then? No. Now there's stuff coming from him. What does he do with that? Does he do unloving things like go to the porn or go to another woman or go to a, to a <coughs> prostitute? Or what does he do when he's not getting it on that day? And what feelings does he have? Does he have rage, anger, resentment, you know, frustration with his partner because he's not having it that day? That's a demonstration of his addiction. Now, it's the same emotionally. It's exactly the same emotionally. And we need to understand that. Every single emotion that I have of rage, anger, resentment, hurt, they are all emotions that show me my own addiction, if I'm willing to see it. But you know, most of the time we're not. What we do instead is we go, yeah, see, that person's not very nice. You know, they didn't love me then. You know, so you know, this is what happens. We have a situation where we've got ourselves, Right? And we've got this yucky woman coming along yelling at me. Right? She's just furious with me. There's all this fury coming out of her towards me. And what do I do? I go, oh, she's a bitch, eh? Right? I just want to get out of her life or get her out of mine, don't I? But actually, right at that moment, I've got an addiction. I've got the addiction, and she's got one too, <laughs> obviously, but I've got one. You see, we don't think that, do we? In that situation, when someone's yelling and screaming at us, what do we think then? <coughs> They've got the addiction. You see, if I've got a feeling of hurt, anger, rage, avoidance, something I want to avoid, depression, because of that event, I'm the one with the addiction. That should make us a bit more self-reflective, shouldn't it, in regard to what happens. Now, of course, she also has one. But can you change her? Of course you can't. You have enough trouble changing yourself, don't we? <laughs> like, so how are we going to ch go changing her? Like, it's going to be very difficult to change her. What we need to do is change our addiction. What is the feeling that's in me? Now, we don't do it by going all Zen on it. You know what I mean by that, don't you? Like, we don't do it like, oh, yeah, yeah, another hour of meditation that day and I'll be right. That doesn't get you away from the fact that you do feel hurt in that situation. So feel the hurt in that situation and go deeper. All right, I'm addicted to something here. What do I really want from her? Well, I want her to treat me nicely. Right? I want her to say, yeah, you're a nice fellow. You actually, yeah, I want her to be nurturing. I want her to, you know, to feel good about me as a guy. Right? So, so I need to look at what it is that I really wanted from her and she's not giving that to me. She's giving something completely different to me and I'm feeling these things. And while I'm feeling these things, I have the choice now to see my addiction in this in interaction or I can avoid it. Most of the time what we do is avoid it and avoid the person. So we write them off, you know. And then five weeks later, another angry woman comes along. You know, at us. 
And oh, I keep attracting these angry ones, <clears throat> you know. And you get frustrated with yourself and all, don't want to look at the addiction and you get rid of her out of your life too. And in the end, you swear yourself off of all women. Does that work? No, you go, you go down to the shopping centre and you, you know, and you're having an interaction with the checkout girl who happens to be behind the checkout at this point, and she's another woman who might be angry, and you have another interaction, right? And then your mum rings you on the phone, and you have another interaction, and before you know it, you've got all these interactions still occurring, and they're still happening because they're showing you there's an addiction in here too, for you. Your addiction is driven, is driving these law of attraction, if you like. The addiction is emotional and something else is underneath it. It's an addiction to not feeling something underneath all of this that's driving it. So, um, there were two other questions there. there is, do you, can you even remember what you uh, had as a question? G'day, AJ. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I wrote it down. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just a quick recap. Um, you can't have both of them at the same time. Emotional addictions and physical addictions? Of course, the majority of us do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so remember, every time we have a physical addiction, it's because even the emotional addiction is not getting met. Right? And the truth is that for many of us, emotional addictions aren't getting met too. Right? So, so an emotional addiction might be, um, uh, for example, um, an emotional addiction of, I need someone else to entertain me. Because I, you know, this happens a lot in our children, you know. As children, you know, we have mothers and fathers that spend all of their time entertaining us. You know, they give us this toy, buy us that thing, do it. You know, many of us think that's being a good parent, right? That's what we believe. And so we feed our child with all this stuff. And so the child now is addicted to being entertained. Does that make sense? There's a, there's a need in the child to have external entertainment as a form of love. And so it grows up and there's no entertainment in its life, so what does it do? It starts attracting, try, it has a strong desire to attract into its life things that are entertaining all the time. So it's got to go out every night to party as a form of entertainment. It's got to keep itself, it's got to keep itself interested in life. And it, so it, has, it can't stay home. If, if she stays home or he stays home by himself for a night, he feels terrible. Right? There's a form of, there's another addiction. But it's a physical one now, They're covering an emotional addiction that's not getting met. So, f so we go out and meet it physically. And so, so yes, almost all of our, we, all of us have a, a list of physical addictions, which are caused by, or the only way that we can meet certain emotional addictions that we've learnt. And then we have a whole set of emotional addictions that are actually getting met, and they are the most difficult to remove from yourself because they're actually getting met. Now, it's easy to see it. Well, look at my life, yes. Yet, yeah, I've got to come home from work every night and have a drink, every night. And if I don't have a drink one night, I have to go down the pub and buy me the drink, right? In other words, I can't go without the drink one night. Why is that? Well, obviously that's an addiction of some kind. I'm reliant on an external substance and oftentimes it's because I'm not happy at work and, and I feel quite depressed when I come home and, Upset and a drink gets me out of that. So the physical addiction is driven by the emotion not being met. If the emotion was being met, I come home and my wife said, let's jump in the sack. You know, that night I don't need to have a drink right? because my addiction is getting met. I feel loved now. I feel loved by my environment. Does that make sense? So oftentimes we act out the unmet emotional addictions through physical addictions. And there was another, if you can bring uh, them. Yep. Is, it, is it working? Yeah. Yep. Um, just a quick question. You say that um, relationships are formed because emotional addictions are not met. No, what I said was most relationships on this planet are formed because emotional addictions are not being met. Okay, because what I thought that if all your emotional addictions have been dealt with, that means that you do not need anybody and nobody needs you. That is very true. But that doesn't mean you might not want to love somebody. You, can you see there's, a very, there's a very big difference between needing somebody and loving somebody. They are almost two opposites. Needing somebody is due to addictions. Loving somebody is, is a gift you wish to give them. They are very, very different from each other. But isn't that love that you are willing to give 
somebody else emotional addiction? No. No. You're allowed to give a gift and it not be a demand from the other person. In fact, it's the best time to give a gift. When's the best time? When do you get the most joy out of giving any gift? It's when the person who you gave the gift never expected it, didn't demand it from you, and really felt gratitude for receiving it, isn't it? Now, when you're in a space of need, or, a child, or anybody's in a space of need of a gift, now do you feel very good giving the gift? Definitely not. Now what you feel like is you're being pushed into it, it's being demanded of you. How many of you enjoy giving gifts at Christmas time? How many of you give gifts at Christmas time? Come on, put up your hands properly. It's okay to own up to it. Right. So the majority of us give gifts at Christmas time, but how many of us avoid it, enjoy it, really passionately enjoy doing it? Right. I, I don't either, by the way, so I'm not putting up my hand. I'm just saying you put up yours if you do, a few of you. Like, in terms of percentage, there's probably 0.1% who do, and, and most of us don't. And yet we go ahead and do it. We go ahead and do it. Why? Because there is a projected demand upon us to do it. That's why we do it. There's a projected demand upon us to do it from our environment and we go ahead and do it. Now, in that moment, we are not being loving because all we are doing is responding to an addiction of somebody else to get them a gift at that particular time. What would you feel if you did not get a gift at Christmas time? A lot of you are being very dishonest with yourself about it because, because you said initially right, that you don't enjoy, most of you don't enjoy giving a gift at Christmas time, which actually means that gifts are being demanded of you at Christmas time, does it not? And you are responding to that demand. Now, if you're responding to the demand of a gift given to you at Christmas time and then none of you feel like you're a part of that demand, then Something's going on, isn't it? The truth is that other people in our lives must feel our demand. Just like we, are give, because we feel theirs. How would you feel if you decided this Christmas you're not going to give any gifts at all, you're not going to give any money presents whatsoever, you're not going to take the kids somewhere just to make up for it either, you're just going to spend a normal day home, there's not going to be any family dinner, there's not going to be, in fact you decide you're going to take the day off from cooking and there's not going to be any of that. Now how do you feel? Guilty, scared, what kind of projections am I going to get? Right? And you'd like to make a comment about how you feel? Or you? I actually did that the last two years. Yeah. I spent the whole day completely by myself, childless, partnerless, and I just cried and cried. Exactly. And cried. It was really freeing. It's, it's very challenging too, isn't it? It was very difficult, but it was very, really good. Yeah. Very challenging. I had a period of my life where for nearly 11 or 12 years, I never spent, I was alone on Christmas Day every year, just by circumstances. It was very challenging. Everyone else is getting together, having their fun, and what do you feel? You just feel absolutely like no one loves me, no one wants me, no one cares about me. No, you just go through lots of emotions. That's the addiction that's driving the gift giving at Christmas, you see? That's the addiction, is that we, we don't want to face these addictions. And, and we're willing to even hoodwink ourselves by saying, oh, I'm not the one who's addicted. It's them, it's them. <laughs> If I don't do... No, you're addicted to avoiding the guilt. So there's an addiction to theirs, you see? There's a lot of addiction. So I'm not saying don't give gifts at Christmas, by the way, am I? I'm saying a gift comes from a heart of love and love is very different to need. So in your question, you asked about need. Need is always driven by addictions. So if I need to have a partner to love, then I am actually in an addictive relationship. If I actually have a partner to love because I am giving the gift of my love to them, right, then I'm in a loving relationship with them. They might not be with me, but I am with them. 
but there are very currently very few of those relationships on this planet. Because for the majority of our relationships, we have a lot of unmet emotional needs from our childhood that our partner is perfectly meeting for us. And in that mode, we are now getting our addictions met and so we feel drawn to them and we feel a feeling of love. Now that doesn't mean that underneath all of that crap, if we could call it that, is some pure emotions. Because often we have some pure emotions mixed up with a lot of addiction in our life. But we need to see the difference between love and need. None of you will need your soulmate. You see, when, when we have the soulmate discussions, you often feel the panic in the audience about, oh, I want my soulmate so bad, you know, I've just been longing for my soulmate. And there's all this needy based childhood, unmet childhood emotions in all of that. You'll get to the point where you want to have a relationship with your soulmate in your life because you want to give the gift of your love to them and you know that they are the person who's in the end going to be the person who's able to, going to receive that love the best too and, and be in this very, very close bond. And it's also because the two of you are halves of the same soul in the end. So there is automatically a relationship between you that is established. That is totally different than need. There is, by the way, a total difference between need and just as a side point, this longing for something. Need, when not met, creates an emotion of, that is out of harmony with love inside of us. So it's, if I need something from you and you don't give me what I need, I then feel sad, hurt, angry, whatever. One of those emotions. Does that make sense? Maybe even afraid. But any emotion that's out of harmony with love that I'm feeling in that moment demonstrates that I was in a codependency desire with you. I was demanding something from you that when you didn't give it to me, I felt this neediness towards you, this demand, and when you didn't give it to me, I got upset, hurt, angry, whatever the emotion was. That's an indication that I am in need with a person and therefore in an addiction. But a longing is very different. I can have a longing for you without actually projecting any needs upon you at all and without projecting any demand upon you at all. Right? This is in fact what God wants from you to receive divine love. Because what happens is when you have a longing, a pure longing inside of your own soul for somebody's love, that's not about neediness. What happens is there's this part of your soul that opens that allows love to be received. And you see, most of us on this planet have a lot of shut down things inside of our soul that prevent us from receiving love. Can you see that? And, as, and so when we have a longing for somebody's love, we open up this vulnerable part of ourselves which allows love to flow into it. Now, that's not the same as a need. A need is a projected demand that the person love you. A longing is just a longing for their love whether they love you or not. And you remain as happy whether they love you as you did when they didn't. Does that make sense? So what often happens is we, we feel a feeling of we're longing for somebody's love this open and vulnerable space gets created. You see this a lot with teenagers, right? Before they get very hurt in love, they, they have this real strong longing for the other person. And they just demonstrate that longing without any subterfuge or deceit. They just open about it. Yeah, you know, I just love him. He's just really beautiful and he's gorgeous. And, and their eyes light up and they, you, have this, you know, have this really open feeling coming from them, right? But then they get hurt. And what starts to happen? Now they're a bit more guarded with their heart, right? You see, when we're in a longing space, we are not guarded with our heart. Our heart is open and vulnerable. And therefore it's open to being hurt as well. But if I have no feelings, addictive emotions in me, will I ever get hurt by having a longing? No. So any hurt that I feel that's due to a longing is because of an unmet emotional need from my childhood that needs to be released anyway. So there's a very big difference between need and love.
for somebody. Most of us are in need, but not many of us are in love. So you know how we say, all these songs are about love. Um, Here I stand with head in hand. What is that? Turn my face to the wall. If she's gone, I can't go on. Feeling two feet small. Uh, <laughs> and then, then, this is the Beatles, right? <laughs> if you didn't recognise it. <laughs> um, and he says, hey, you've got to hide your love away. All right. Why, this is what we do. Isn't it? Now, what is he describing there? Is he describing love? He's not. See, all these so-called love songs that are on earth, they're not actually describing love. They're describing unmet emotional addictions. <laughs> right? <laughs> they are. It's like, it's like, here I stand with head in hand, turn my face to the wall. What is, it, what is this looking like a lot to you? Like, <laughs> and if she's gone, I can't go on, feeling two feet small. Right? In other words, what's my addiction with this woman? My addiction is that she makes me feel like a man. She makes me feel grown up. She makes me feel whole. Does that make sense? And when she goes out of my life, what am I feeling instead? I'm feeling little, like a child again, like an unloved child, ironically, which actually describes the unmet emotional addiction that the person who wrote the song had. Sorry about that, John, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> John's here, actually, right? He's listening to that. And, and um, myself and Monica last week talked to John Lennon, actually, um, which, uh, which is one reason why I used that song. <laughs> but, um, he, but can you see how many of our love songs are not love songs? They're addiction songs. Uh, and, and I look back on a lot of the songs that I used to play, you know, and, and, and feel about, and the majority of them were all this unmet addiction for my, and desire, mixed with desire for my soulmate. But there was just like, if, if you have a look at my song collection that I play on the guitar, a couple of hundred songs probably <coughs> that I prefer, almost every single one of them <laughs> was an addiction that I didn't have being met at the time. Like, honestly, it was just... Like. No wonder they're so popular. And then you get the other songs, right, which are all about addictions as well. You know, like, you know, how about... Um, how about the eagles, lying eyes? You can't hide those lying eyes. Your smile is a thing in disguise. What's that describing? That's describing a relationship with a woman who was deceitful right? that from his own past and he's now describing an, an event that is in her life, right? And, and why is he describing that? Because he gave his heart and obviously her deceit crushed it and he feels terrible. Remember, every time you feel terrible, there's an addiction being met. So it's like there's so many, there's so many songs that are like that. Some of the songs are really interesting about addictions because there's other ones like 10cc, you heard of 10cc, a song called uh, Not In Love. You know, I'm not in love, don't forget it. It's just a silly phase I'm going through. In other words, he doesn't even want to admit that he's in love anymore, right? <laughs> because he, said, he says, just because I call you up, don't think it's right. No, don't think. It doesn't mean you mean that much to me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, so there he is. He's like inside of himself. He's got all this love going. Whoa, 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 whoa. You know, I'm really hanging out for her. He doesn't want to admit it. Why? Because of another addiction. And another addiction is he doesn't want to get hurt by admitting it and then being open about it and being rejected. So he's just so afraid of rejection. You know, a lot of these songs are all about just addictions, rejection, and that they're all actually not about love. I suppose if you think about it, 
a lot of the songs that could be made about love wouldn't sound very good. <laughs> because they don't connect to any sadness inside of you, you know what I mean? And so, so when it's all happy, there's this thing of, what do I sing about now? Like, <laughs> in the spirit world, you, and even on earth you'll see, we'll be able to sing about lots of things even when we're in that space. But, but when you think about it today on earth, even a lot of the music industry is driven by deep despair and sadness. Deep disillusionment, a lot of the emotions being expressed are all about our unhealed core emotions and they're driven by needs. And so we often have these understandings of love inside of ourself, right, that are very, very distorted. Uh, we believe it to be love but actually it's need. And we believe this to be love but it's need to. Like even the need to have your child respect you is a need. Does your child have to respect you? No. And in fact, it's just an additional job you're giving your child that he doesn't even need to have. Ironically, when you let go of the need to be respected, often your children do respect you even more. Right? But it's not because of the projected need. You see, a lot of our love-based relationships, not just uh, with, between sexual relationships, but, but also our love-based relationships with with parents, children, brothers, sister, friends, a lot of them are based on codependent addictive needs that are being met. Which is very, very different, remember, to having a longing. So I can long for your love and I can long for God's love without projecting a need at you. The, how do I know whether it's different? By my response when I don't get what I long for. So if I'm longing for something and I don't get what I'm longing for and I get angry, upset, sad, depressed, all those feelings, then obviously my original longing was not a longing but a need, a addic an addiction. Yeah. If we can go up to Dennis with the mic and then across to Jen. Hi, OJ. Uh, a couple of things. So you're saying that our record collection is a history of our addictions? It's a fantastic record of your addictions, yeah. yeah. Mm. It's a, in fact, my, my suggestion would be um, when, you, when you play your music, to actually feel about your addictions that, that are being demonstrated in the music itself. Mm. Um, it's, it's a fantastic way of accessing a lot of causal emotion. Yeah. A lot of times, by the way, just as a note about music, we often use music to connect with the writer's causal emotion in order to avoid our own. Do you understand what I mean by that? So, so in other words, I can't connect with my sadness about losing my girl. I don't want to cry about it. I'm not connecting with it. So what I do is I put on a song and that's about losing my girl and all of a sudden now I can cry. Why is that? Because I'm connecting to the writer's sadness I'm actually needing help to feel my own sadness. Now, I'm not saying don't do that. What I'm saying is notice that I must have a block to feeling my own sadness in that, to need the music to feel the sadness. So yes, your music collection is a very good way of actually accessing causal emotion inside of you. Unfortunately for most of us, we, our music connect collection is the way we act out our addiction. Does that make sense to all of you? Like, so, so I had this whole list of songs, all soulmate lost songs. And while I could play those, sing those, enjoy those, I always would like those songs, did you think I was feeling my soulmate loss? Mm -mm. When I started feeling my soulmate loss, all of a sudden I look at those songs and wow, that song was telling me quite a lot. That's how I felt. I don't feel that much anymore and it's now quite amusing to sing the song rather than all this anguish, you know, when I'm singing the song, you know? And it's because now the addictions have changed because of dealing with some of the causal emotion. Yeah, thanks. Um, the second part is that once we deal with the causal emotion, then all the addictions that are attached to that just drop away? Yes, yes, that's exactly what happens. Yeah. Thanks. That sounds good, doesn't it? So all of a sudden the thousands of addictions get reduced down to, <laughs> yeah. 
But as you know, as all of you who have been on this path for some time know, getting to causal emotions can take months. And do you know why it often takes months? Because we refuse to acknowledge our addictions. You know, we're so in the addiction that we don't acknowledge it's there. And, and as soon as we recognise the addiction, wham, the causal emotion's there. It's amazing. I've had so many times myself where I've been for months on end in my addiction, right? So, for example, a woman comes along who's a bit upset. She demands time of me. So I sit down with her and I explain all about her emotions and what's going on for her. And, and, and three hours later, I'm still explaining what's going on for her. And she's going, yes, 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 whatever. And then she's asking me another question, another question, another question, another question. And I'm, I'm starting to go to, wanting to go to the toilet even. I'm not even going to the toilet, right? Because I'm feeling her demand and I feel like I have to respond to it. I don't even let myself have my physical needs met. Right? I'm there holding on to my bladder doing this. Right? And so I go, wow, that, uh, three hours, wow, that helped her a lot. My, my bladder now feels like it's a bursting balloon, you know what I mean? <laughs> and that hurts. And I hurt myself meeting, meeting her addiction. So what does that mean? I have an addiction. Does that make sense? I have, what's my addiction? My addiction is... The angry woman comes along, I've got to talk with her, talk with her, talk with her, talk with her until she no longer wants me. And then she goes and then I can go to the toilet. Well, what, why is that? It's because I'm afraid of the angry woman. I'm afraid of upsetting her. I'm afraid of you know, stopping halfway through and saying, no, that's enough to this conversation now. Actually, you're angry. I don't want to talk to you at all, come to think of it. You know, like I'm afraid of doing that. Does that make sense? I'm afraid of doing that because the angry woman's emotions are getting projected and I'm in my addiction, my addiction of placating the angry woman on every, in every possible opportunity. Why would I decide to placate an angry woman? Because if I don't placate the angry woman, what's the angry woman going to do? She's going to be angry and am I going to feel very loved then? No, because, but while I'm placating her, she will listen. She will, you know, she will stay in this what seems to be a loving transaction with me. But actually, is it loving? No, it's not. Of course it's not loving. And the proof is, I'm in pain with my bladder <laughs> while I'm doing it. Right in that moment, I am proving to myself my own addiction is so strong that I'm willing to actually go through personal pain in my physical body in order to get this addiction met. So, you know, I do that for, I don't know how many years I did that. So, I did that for years. Anytime a woman wanted to have a chat with me about something emotionally, I would do that automatically. Right? Now, many of you women are finding you don't get very long with me because <laughs> I'm allow a lot less out, I'm a lot out of that addiction. Does that make sense? Like, but I've had to see it first. So I've had to see what's going on, feel that. Feel the pain that I'm causing my own body responding to that addiction. And then when I, when I do that, I see, ah, this isn't their problem. This, is actually, this, this angry woman is actually helping me see my addiction. Not through her words, but because of how I respond to it causes me pain. And if I notice that, then I can see my addiction. And that's what the whole point of the interaction is for me. I'm seeing my addiction here. Wow. And, and when I see my addiction, I can then go, all right, let's challenge this addiction. So how do I challenge the addiction? Well, it's really easy, you know. The next angry woman that comes up, <laughs> you speak with her one hour instead of three. <laughs> how did that feel? Well, that felt a bit, yeah, you know, at the end she was pretty upset because I terminated the discussion and, 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 and feel about that. And then the next angry woman that comes along, what do you do? You challenge the addiction a bit more. You say, you're, you're angry with me and you've got a very unloving demand with me. I can't speak with you at all. Now how's she going to react to that? And straight away I can feel my addiction again. Wow, that's what I'm afraid of. Now, to give you an example of this, um, um, I don't, if, babe, are you Mary? Mary? Yes. Oh, she's, you know, can I, can I give the example of you on the weekend with the group? Yeah. Um, 
when on the Saturday, on the Friday night and Saturday of the group with with the groups Mary does, um, often many of you come to the groups bring along a group of spirits with you, right? In fact, all of us do that. We all bring along a group of spirits with us. So if I'm in a bit of a shutdown place, then I'll bring a lot of shutdown spirits with me in a shutdown place. If I've got anger within me as a woman, I'll probably bring along a lot of angry women spirits with me into the group as well. If I'm uh, trying to get out of my life, I'll bring a lot of spirits who are also trying to get away from their own life with them as well, who are influencing me. So, so what happens on every group that Mary is doing with you, there's a whole group of spirits coming along. Right? And that whole group of spirits that is coming along actually have a huge influence on every single person there. And then my own attitude has an influence on you. So if, if there's only 20 of us, and one of us of the 20, one of the 20 is in a very, very shut down emotional place, that person heavily affects the rest of the 19. Right? Just by projecting out, don't you feel, don't you feel in front of me, don't you feel in front of me, Right, just by projecting it out. Anyway, this happens at the groups really often. And Mary's been learning through her emotions to actually work through the addiction for her. And the addiction for her was to, to, to fit, she feels guilty every time she confronts somebody with truth. Right? She feels terrible about it. And very afraid of the spirit's response <coughs> through the person. So last weekend there were three or four people who were heavily spirit influenced in their in there in coming along to the group now now mary came home friday night and we talked about it um, and mary had been very truthful all friday night with the entire group really confronting like saying to people the truth and come home but come home feeling quite exhausted and wondering why and we talked about why and about what was going on and then the next morning um, um, i came along at the lunchtime and we had another discussion about what was going on because Mary had had another a morning where there were three or four people, the same three or four people as the previous night, who, who she was having these interactions with and they were very resistive, very, but she wasn't saying, any, saying anything to them or removing them from the group. She was just in this space. Now, during the break, during this break, the lunch break, we started discussing it together again and what happened was Mary went into this really deep terror about doing anything about it. And she went through lots of fear and lots of emotions come up for you, didn't it, darling? Like she, some of you might have noticed who were there. Mary went into the toilet and had a cry for a period of time. Just to work her way through the emotion of her fear of why she was avoiding asking the people who were actually shut down to leave. Now, she had a lot less trouble asking a man to leave than she did asking the females to leave. When she asked the man to leave, she felt she had done the right thing. But asking the females to leave, she was petrified of doing that. So what happened afterwards is she did ask the different ones to leave and, and the group as a result had a big benefit, positive benefit. Now, please, if you're one of the persons who left, don't feel that it was all your fault because there's lots of different things at play, including the spirits at play. And you do need to look at your emotions as to what went on. But, but getting back to Mary's emotions, the addiction was that she wanted everyone to feel happy in the group. But the irony is when we want that to happen to everybody, everybody can't if there's all different other addictions at play. And we've got to remove the ones who are creating the most addictions in order for the others to grow. Does that make sense? And the addiction for Mary at the time was this feeling inside of herself that she was just petrified of a woman's spirit-induced rage. Ironically, one of the women in particular that was removed went into a, a rage with Mary overnight, which Mary felt quite strongly, and said quite a lot of different things um, that Mary could feel. And and that even caused more of her emotion to come up about how afraid she is of an angry woman who is spirit overcloaked, feeling her rage. And in the, in the end of that, the next day, Mary could stay in her truth without feeling fear. In particular, without feeling fear with women anywhere near as much. So while 
there's still a bit more work, isn't there, darling, to do with the women projection. You, you feel like heaps different, totally different. And, and now Mary doesn't avoid saying the truth to the women. So you, have you noticed that in the last few weeks from Mary? Any of you have talked to her? <laughs> you will notice that she's been much more direct with you about what she feels from you. She felt it all before. She just couldn't say it because of being afraid of the anger and rage from the woman. So what was happening? What was happening was the woman would get angry with Mary and Mary's addiction was to try and placate the woman and in that addiction was the underlying fear driving it, the fear of a spirit-induced woman's rage driving this need to placate. And, and once, once Mary felt those fears, now she can actually stand in the presence of an angry woman and still say the truth. Right? And you will actually get to the place yourself where you can stand in the presence of people totally enraged with you and not feel afraid. You can stand in the presence of people totally enraged with you slinging a rope around a tree to hang you on it and still not feel afraid. Right? But it's only by releasing the addictions that that can ever occur. So can we start seeing the pattern of addictions? And we're going to sort, so this, this first section, I'm trying to explain to you how big they are. And the next session after our break, I'm going to talk about how to actually access them emotionally and process them. Does that make sense? So that's why we want to, but we want to see how big they are and how much they're driving your life. That's very important. Now, Jen, if we can go, and then down to Alan. Thank you, AJ. Um, I recently came to the realisation um, that I... Um, so I'm having trouble staying here. Hang on. Can I stop you? I'm not going to let you say the rest because you are currently in an addiction. You are feeling your emotion when you start talking to me, but you're not feeling it beforehand. So why do you need to speak to feel the emotion in a group? There's an addiction. Do you follow me? So let's look at the, let's look at the addiction instead. What's the addiction? What do you feel with people most of the time? Complete fear and overwhelm. I no, that, that's afraid. not what you feel. That's the blockages to what you feel. What do you feel? What's underneath the blockages? To, pe to people. Do you feel people listen to you? Do you feel people care about you? Do you feel people li in particular hear you? No. Okay. So as soon as I give you a forum for people to hear you, you start feeling teary. Can you see the, rela the re reaction that you have? We give you a forum to listen to you and you start connecting with the emotion that nobody's ever heard me all my life. And you don't allow yourself to feel that emotion and instead you tell us the story, whatever the story becomes, but you're not allowing yourself to feel the underneath the emotion still, which is nobody wants to hear from me. Okay. So can you just fit, sit on that emotion for the rest of... Thank you. And then when you feel a bit more clear of that emotion, we'll answer your question, whatever that would be. Can we come down the front with the microphone? What I'm going to start doing with you in the seminars is actually start addressing the addictions with you. Even many of our questions, and, and, and by the way, don't stop asking questions just because you hear what I'm about to say. <laughs> but even many of our questions are based around our addictions being met. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to focus on the emotional part of the question a lot. Does that make sense? What the emotion is driving the question rather than the question itself. So many times I will answer the question itself but only firstly after we deal with the emotion driving the question itself. Right? I'm re 
really scared to uh, talk to you, so that's my emotion. Um, but there's a great book called The Five Love Languages, yep. which I used to think was really terrific. Yep. And, it show, and it talks about five different ways that people feel loved. Yes. And I used to think it was great. Isn't it a fantastic but book? But, but it tells you exactly <laughs> what you know, your um, addictions are. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many books that have been written on this planet that are basically about love, supposedly, that are all just basically defining addictions. Like, you know, there's this common concept that you have a need to be loved. Do you know that the need that you think you have to be loved is actually an emotional addiction and it's not even real? The truth is actually that when we are loved completely, as a child, when we are loved completely as a child, you grow up without the need to be loved. And instead, you have a, need, a desire, not even a need, to give love. Right? Now, because none of us are grown up in that place at this point, we all have a need to be loved. Uh, that's the result. So what we do then is we go and make a book that tells us about all the ways in which we need love, which are all about the addictions. Yeah. And, it, and, it's very, and, that, and I've heard people mention that book before. And they said it was such an enlightening part of their life and so forth. And I'm going, oh no, like, <laughs> because it's actually a complete description of how you receive love, which is addictive in itself. Yeah, powerful. Um, there is so many books like that, so many books that define the human race nowadays and define love are actually about addictions that we have. When you get into a space where you, lo where you feel loved completely by God, and this is the beauty of your relationship with God, you will not need love from anyone because intrinsically you are complete. You love yourself completely and, God, and you feel God's love for you completely. And in that moment, you are complete. You do not need love from any other person. And ironically, that is also the time when you are the most loving to every other person. Now, the problem is, though, on the planet, is we try to manufacture that state intellectually rather than being in that state emotionally. And, and if you deal with all your addictions with God, you will get to that place emotionally, which is actually a very beautiful place to be. If we go. Sharon, Hi. isn't it? Hi, yep. Um, I don't know what's going on, but I just feel confused by everything you're saying, and I keep disappearing, and I'm trying to hear it, and I know I have a lot of addiction, so I'm not really sure what's going on. All right. For those of you who that's happening to right now, the reason why is quite easy to explain. Here is you. And obviously you're surrounded by people, but you've also got some codependent addictive relationships with spirits. All of us have generally got these codependent addictive relationships with spirits. Now, if you as a person start looking at your addictions you know, start and start processing your addictions, what happens to this group of people's addictions getting met through you? Can you see that they're not going to get their addictions met through you anymore? Now, can you see that that's quite a confronting place for them to be? They don't want to be in an audience where you're learning about processing addictions when they are hooked into your addictions for their own addictions to be met. And they know it. And so what they do is they just try to shut you down. They project on you a heaviness. Oh, it's so, oh, so sleep now. Like, yeah. You know, they... I can't, I, and some of you even have described in the past that you can't even hear, you're trying to even hear, but it's like the words are not even going in. Some of you have even described that. And what that is, is these spirits projecting at you a huge desire for you to not deal with your addictive behaviours because they live off of your addictive behaviour. So it's an indication that you've got some spirits with you who are in that space and you need to look at why you're addicted to them. Does that make sense? 
Do you have any ideas what well, I'm addicted to? With there's that? literally thousands of reasons why we can be addicted to somebody, isn't there? Remember I said there's thousands of addictions, so it must, it must then follow that there's thousands of reasons. Of course, for each individual, the most powerful thing is to start discovering it yourself. So while I can certainly say what, what the hooks are, it's far better if you can go into the hooks yourself and actually start discovering. Pray about them. Pray about the hooks that you have with the spirits. So, so under, you know, and the way to deal with this with spirits is you know when they do this to you. When, when do they make you feel a bit sort of zony outy, you know, like a bit tired, a bit like, oh, I've got to have a sleep now, or I've got to go and have something to eat now. When they make you feel like this, notice the circumstances. Does that make sense? So this circumstance is you're being told about addictions. So that means there must be some addictions in you that these spirits don't want you to know about. Yeah. Right? Another circumstance might be, oh, um, my boyfriend, my husband is, is projecting sexually at me. And I go into, oh, I'm a bit tired and, you know, I can't, you know. So, all right, I know the spirits are somehow hooked into something inside of me avoiding <coughs> sexual interaction. What's going on there? It might be that, uh, you know, I come home from work quite, quite exhausted and I sit down and within five minutes I'm asleep. All right? Now, obviously, that could be that I've just, I'm sleep deprived and I need to have some sleep. But a lot of times it can also mean that I'm actually avoiding the interactions that are going on at home. So, so notice when it's happening. You, and this is where we can take a lot of personal responsibility by noticing just by noticing the events under which circumstances occur, things occur, the circumstances. So allow yourself to see, all right, I've got either some pals in the spirit world here, they've probably been with me for ages. I don't even really notice their personalities. I even sometimes think they're part of my own personality. And what's happening is under certain circumstances, all of a sudden I feel tired and there's no, exp you know, no possible explanation other than something's happening spiritually. Because a lot of times we're, we're, we're alert, 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 and tired, alert. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's that, it's that pronounced, the change in us is that pronounced, that we're, we go from being alert to being tired instantly. Now, obviously, in a natural way, you wouldn't go from being alert to being tired without there being some kind of emotional thing happening. So let yourself see the influence. Spirits, the only way a spirit can control you is through your addictions. They can't physically get hold of you without there firstly being an addiction emotionally through which they can connect with you. Do you, do you understand? And this is a powerful thing to understand about spirits. Spirits can only affect you through addictions. Spirits can only affect you through addictions. Who do you want to ask a question and then come down here? Uh, AJ, the, when the spirits are there and they're not affecting, so they're present in your space, potentially you've got your addictions, they've been drawn to your space as a result of your addictions, Yep. and uh, then for some reason your addictions are amplified and they affect. Yep. What is the process there of how do they actually affect that drowsiness or that stupefaction. Yep. What is the transmission from them to you that causes that effect? It's not actually the transmission from them to you. It's actually the transmission of them sucking from you. They're extracting from you. They're extracting from you. But what is that? What is the power that they have that, uh, that, that uh, causes that sucking? And they don't have power in it. It's what you give them and what you're getting in return. So let me illustrate. Um, in, can I be specific and illustrate it in your case? Yeah, go ahead. All right. So with yourself, you've got yourself, you are very mediumistic. So you've got a number of male spirits around you. All right. Now, these male spirits have some addictions of their own. And some of them are addicted to power and control. All right. But some of them are just addicted to... Um, they feel they did not live a full life on earth. They feel like they had a life cut short, you know, and, and so now what they want to do is just, 
live life in full on earth. They have this feeling in them, right? So it's about, it's about their addiction to feeling, not wanting to feel sad about their shortened life on earth. So they, they've got that emotion as well. Now, they're males, right? And what they want to do is they want to choose a person on earth who's mediumistic, who actually has a who has a powerful being, is a powerful being in their own right, right? And then what they want to do is suck him dry of his power by actually using techniques, emotional techniques to do it. And what, what the spirits with you are doing is this. They actually can feel how much you weren't valued by your father, right? And in fact, not only just by your father, your mother too. There's uh, obviously your mum quite is quite was quite domineering and uh, overbearing. And I know you may not feel that right now, but if you can feel when you don't do what she wants, what does she do? Um, what did she do when you didn't do what she wanted? There was. I'm uh, sorry, I'm not conscious. Of that. Um, maybe Anna might be able to answer it better because she can. Okay, so 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 Peter never did what never didn't do what Mum wanted because because it was sort of like an automatic thing, yeah. So so what happens with these spirits? So these spirits are, uh, are male spirits who, uh, in particular, male spirits who who want to, and there's a feeling of sort of mateship that they have with you. That they feel you, they're mates with you. They are helping you. They're helping you be powerful. They're helping you to enjoy your life. They're helping you. They actually even set up events around your life, uh, influencing other people so that things go quite smoothly for you in your life with regard to, in particular with regard to finances, but, uh, but also in regard to interactions with, um, uh, with, with men in particular. They make sure that everything goes smoothly, smoothly there, as smoothly as it can. And the re in return, what they want from you is for you to act out some things for them sexually. In other words, they want to set up this, they, this thing that they, their, their feeling that they didn't had a cut short life means that, and now where they are, they can't actually have sexual interaction with women because there are no women around them at the moment where they are because the women wouldn't want to be around them at the moment, the, these spirits. And so what they do is they set up an interaction where if they can help this man become as powerful as he can possibly be, then that means that there'll be all these, hopefully all these women attracted to him, right? that they can start having relationships. These men can start having, they, they don't expect you to have the relationships but they want to have relationships with them. Do you, do you follow me? Now, one of the things that is, is, is happening for yourself is that your, your hook into them is the desire to be, like, to be valued as a male, the desire to be a strong male. And, uh, and that's, that causes them to be attracted to you because that's what they need in order to get their addictions met through you. And... In the past, uh, it, this, a lot of this began um, when you were taking drugs in the past? A lot of what began. Oh, sorry, a lot of what began. The, the actual attraction of the spirits? Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Um, you, if you could think about that period of time um, in your life when you, when you were taking drugs, um, I believe you were in Canada at the time. Weren't you? Yes. Yep. And um, if you can just feel about that time, you will actually feel times when you felt more buoyant um, than other times, like uh, when you felt more en energetic and buoyant than other times. Now, the times when you, don't feel when you feel buoyant, often they're giving you something in order to get something in return. And often you feel tired afterwards. And one of the reasons why you've been drawn into meditation a lot is to actually recover from what they are drawing from you. Because when you go into meditation, you're actually now in a space where they can't connect to you as well. And, they can't, and since they can't connect to you as well, what happens is there's this, uh, you then feel infused with energy, basically, from, from God, infused with energy from God and from other spirits, 
not the spirits who are drawing from you, and that gives you a feeling of energy, control, and everything, and that, it tops you up, ready for them to take from you again, in a lot of ways. So the way to disconnect from them is to work through the issues, in particular with Dad, the issues of feeling like um, um, desiring Dad's attention, desiring Dad's love, what you have to do to get Dad's love, um, and I know Dad's past, but it's um, a, lot, a lot of it's about the sadness of his passing, but also the feeling of competition with Dad. Like, um, if you can allow yourself to feel about those feelings, because they are what's, control what's causing this desire inside of you for men to surround you who, are, who, who will create the power. And, and I feel that once you do that, you'll feel, you'll feel quite a bit different inside of yourself. If you can also be sensitive in your interaction with women, so it, like talk to Anna perhaps about how she's felt in the interaction with you in the past in terms of like when she feels you're there and when she feels they're there. Almost all of you in relationships at times have felt when somebody else is present with you. Do, do, do you understand that feeling? Um, some of you have had it to a large degree, so you have it pretty clear when they're present. But sometimes you feel you're not getting the person who's next to you. You're getting someone else instead. My suggestion at that point in time is just stop whatever you're doing. So if you're making love at that point, stop. You know, if you're just talking with each other, just stop. And just say, I don't feel like I'm getting you now. So someone else is present here. Someone I don't really know very well. or It's a pattern that I see happening. And you might see it happen under, over certain times. And this is where your partner can help a lot, like, or, or a, a person who knows you well can help you a lot, just to help you identify the linkages. But with these guys, because they're addicted to the power, um, they're going to, you're going to get quite exhausted with them, with the interaction with them. But they, but they also give you a lot of things, and that's your hook into them. So they give you... You know how you have this feeling sometimes you go to a land or a property or whatever and you just know it's all going to work. Like, you just have this feeling it's all going to work. Like, they are the ones who set up a lot of those things for you. Because um, higher spirits generally wouldn't bother about that kind of stuff. They're more interested in your emotions and feelings and your connection with God directly. But these spirits are more interested in what physically can take place. So, so let yourself feel it that moment, you will know what the, your hook is as well. And this is something for all of you to bear in mind. When you feel in the moment, you will know the hook straight away. You, 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 don't, have so, you don't need to ask about it very much. You can actually just focus on what's going on in the moment itself. Um, do you follow me by that? So let's say, let's say right in this moment, I've got a feeling... Um, Let's say I'm in a situation where I'm talking to maybe Mary, and right in the moment, in the moment, I've got a feeling of, like, um, wow, I feel really sad about my relationship with Mary. Let's say just in that moment, and then all of a sudden, I find myself talking about music or, or, or talking about food we're going to eat. Or, do you know what I mean? What I need to do is just backtrack a little and go back to that moment and go, all right, I was feeling sadness about my relationship that I obviously didn't want to feel, but what got me onto the subject of food? Like, how come that come about? Like, what was happening there? Allow myself to just backtrack and see the actual event that, that caused me to get out of that moment of the feeling and into this totally different state and allow myself to see the link. And when I allow myself to see the link, I'll also see the hook that I have into any spirits trying to help me get into that state. So if you can do that, what will happen is the, the spirits around you will start, uh, they'll start often becoming quite afraid because the spirits around you want this hook to remain intact. So they are going to avoid any addiction or they want you to avoid any addictions, particularly the addictions that allow them to have an emotional connection with you. 
At the soul level, what's actually happening, Peter, because you asked the question about how they actually suck you dry, how you, how they, or give you things. If you can imagine this is your soul and this is their soul, and you know from your, you know from your own study you've got these chakra points coming out of your body, right? So in your body, and, and it's not your physical body, it's actually your spirit body that has these points coming out of it. You know that there's sort of energy vortexes, right? So, and you know that there's these seven primary energy vortexes coming out, which people call the seven chakras, right? Now these chakras or energy vortexes are controlled by the emotion in the soul, right? At any one point in time. Now, you have a whole series of vortexes down, your, in, down the rear of your body. They are all about your future intentions. And you have a whole series of vortexes down the front of your body, which are about your current emotions. So you've got emotions and intentions from the soul driving these energy vortexes. Now, if I have one of these energy vortexes have an emotion inside of me. Let's say the emotion inside of me is um, seeking dad's approval. Now this energy vortex is going to affect primarily my base and second chakra areas of my body. So there'll be a certain type of energy flowing out and a certain type of energy that this emotional injury creates that that causes a conduit to only flow under certain conditions, and that is when a male gives me approval. So he, here's our spirit friend who also has a spirit body, who also has a series of vortexes coming out of their body from their soul. If he can see that the way he can connect into your body is by actually projecting at you a feeling of approval and he's a male, and he can project at you a feeling of approval, then you will open up this conduit between you and he, via which energy can flow. Does that make sense? Is it done, done subconsciously? It's done based on the emotion that you deny. You can also do it consciously, in other words, do it on the emotions you accept, but for, the, for many of us, we've got a combination of emotions we deny and emotions we accept, and it's the emotions we deny, which we call sort of like the subconscious emotions, that cause this connection. So if I've got this feeling that I don't want to actually feel, that I never had dad's approval, I will, my addiction is going to be seeking the male approval. Right? And so I'm seeking the male. The way I get approval from men on this planet generally is by being a, quite a powerful male generally, and, and, and demonstrating that power in some way. Either, you know, you see a lot of men becoming physically big, uh, you know, into sport because other men admire a sportsman. You see, you see a lot of guys becoming very powerful financially because other men admire financial power and so forth. There's all these different emotions. So underneath that is the seeking of God's approval, which turns into an addiction, and our addiction gets met by actually creating an, a situation in our life where we get approval. And the beauty is that, in a way, is that it is a beautiful process. These spirits see that addiction and they actually project at me through that addiction the emotion that I want. But once they have that physical connection with me, they can now project other things through that connection and they can drop thoughts in my mind in that projection because now I'm open to thoughts and feelings coming from them. Now, to illustrate it in a physical environment, let's say you go along to the pub with a group of mates. If you're home by yourself or home with your wife only and you're not with a group of mates, you'll often say very different things than when you're in a group of, at a pub with a group of mates. Does that make sense? You'll often say different things. It might not mean that you feel them, but you'll often say them. And why do, you say, why do we say them? Because in the environment when we're at home, if we said those same things, we might get disapproval from our wife. Right? So what we do is we don't say them there, but now when we're in the pub with our mates, there's no disapproval from our wife coming. So now we're a bit more open about what we might say. And so we say other things. And it's the environment of the mates that caused us to be even more open. 
And that might be all of our mates have uh, relationships with women who are a bit angry. So we all get together, go to the pub, and we all talk about, you know, oh, she did this this week again and she did that. You know, we're open about talking about it because our wives are not going to get angry with us because they can't hear the conversation. And so we are more open and therefore more allowing of what our mates say to us as a result. So there's a dialogue that starts generating that we wouldn't normally have with our wife, but we're having it with our mate because there's certain emotions that get satisfied with this dialogue. And it's exactly the same with our connection with spirits. And this is why addictions are the most powerful thing to deal with even with spirits, because the, the addictions actually open us up emotionally to receive things, but only certain things. And they close down emotionally to block other things. And it's the addictions that often control that. You see, if I was in a completely loving state, I would actually be open to everything, but not responding to anything without it being part of my desire. So what happens with our addictions is there is always the compromise that occurs. Every addiction comes with a price. And the price is the compromise of yourself that you're going to have to make to get the addiction met. Right. So let me illustrate that perhaps. Um, let's say I have the addiction right, that a woman, I badly want a woman's attention. Right. And let's say I badly want the woman's sexual attention. Let's say that's my addiction. So I want sexual attention from the woman because I feel like, obviously as a male, I then feel like I'm not very sexy for the woman and all those things. That's the underlying causal emotion. So I want the sexual projection from the woman. But how do you get sexual projections from women? A lot of times, many women won't give you a sexual projection just in its own right. What they'll do is they, they want to feel like you're going to give them security before they'll give you a sexual projection. So if a, male, if a male's going to give them security, now they're willing to project sexually at that male. So, so what, what is the underlying emotional addiction? I need the sexual projection of the woman to feel good about myself. What's my compromise? My compromise is that I have to make the woman feel secure and safe before she'll sexually project at me. So what I do, and spend a lot of my life doing, is running around trying to make every woman in my life safe and secure so that I can get the sexual projection that makes me feel like I'm a good male. Now I might not even act upon the sexual projection, it's just, just so that I can get it, so that I feel good about myself as a male. And it's the compromise that actually causes most of our problems with addictions. The compromise, the, the, uh, the willingness to compromise. So when it comes to spirit interactions, we are often very willing to compromise because of what those spirits who are with us are giving us. But we are also often very unwilling to see at the same time what they're giving us. Because most of the time we want to feel that it came from within ourselves. Does that make sense? We want to believe that it was us that created that thing when it wasn't, and we want to not believe that it was some spirits with us. Because if we started facing the fact that, ah, oh, there were spirits with us giving us these emotions, what would we do? We'd feel a bit sleazy, we'd feel a bit like, it would taint the whole experience, wouldn't it? So what we often do is we just like out of sight, out of mind type thing, right? <laughs> uh, that way we can ignore that that's actually happening. No, that's not happening. No, they're not there. I can feel they're not there. That's fine. You know, are they all gone now? Yeah, I'm sure they're all gone now. Right, they're all gone. And now what I can do is I can go, yeah, that was all created just because of me and what I felt and what I did. And isn't that, aren't I good? And, and I can feel really good about myself, not realising that actually a lot of these feelings are coming from somebody else because of my addiction. And I'm compromising. So you've got to be really honest with yourself when it comes to spirit-based addictions. They're very, very hard to deal with um, because you need to be so honest. 
Um, AJ, I've got a bit confused now when, with respect to law of attraction. Mm -hmm. Like, um, law of attraction is God's messenger of truth to us. Mm -hmm. So if we've got good things happening to us, good things happening for us, mm -hmm. things falling into place in our lives, mm -hmm. um, that to me seems like it's... Seems like a good thing, right? Yeah, it's a good thing. But if, it, if those sort of things can happen through spirits, um, yeah, dark spirits giving us things so that they can suck things out of us, yep. how do we tell the difference? Well, it's quite easy. By your own exhaustion, you can usually tell. But let's look at the law of attraction specifically. You're forgetting that there's two things that drive the law of attraction. What are they? Desire is one of them. And what's the other one? Emotional injuries. So your emotional state, right? Now, what I've talked about are your emotional state driving the law of attraction, but your desires also do drive your law of attraction. So if my desire is to feel powerful, if that's a desire in me to feel powerful, it can be still an addiction, can it not? And it can be an addiction disharmonious with love, can it not? And yet I may get to feel powerful because my desire is so powerful that it creates circumstances in which I become powerful. Does that make sense? So, so the truth is that it's a mixture of both desire and unhealed emotion that create your law of attraction, not just unhealed emotion. So you can have a desire to be powerful and that desire be brought about just from your desire. Like, how many of you, like a lot of you watch The Secret, right? And there was a guy on there that talked about how he had a house, that he had a picture of a house that he put on the wall, and then like five years later he looked at the picture of the house and he, that he was in, and he realized that was the picture of the house that was on his wall, something like that anyway. And what caused that? It was his desire. Was his desire pure? Why does he have a desire for a house that's like a $5 million mansion that uses up like 10 times the amount of energy than than a, than a house that, w that he could normally live in and, it, and it's got this humongous pool that he never uses and, he, and he's using all these resources of the earth and if everyone on the planet used the same resources we'd need five earths to supply it. Is all of that love? No. But he did have a pure desire and your pure desire certainly can create your law of attraction. What I'm talking about here is bringing all of your desires into harmony with divine love. So in the end, you, may, you might think you might desire to have a $5 million mansion now, but once you bring all of your desires into harmony with divine love, you might not desire that thing anymore. And that would prove that that desire was actually based around an emotional injury. But your desires are just as powerful in your law of attraction as your emotions. In fact, the reality is your desires are even more powerful. That's why I talked to you recently about the law of desire and how powerful it is. But you can have desires that are disharmonious with love and get them met. That's how the majority of people on earth damage themselves, by having a desire that's not harmonious with love and having it met. So you can think of your addictions as desires out of harmony with love. And they so create your law of attraction. Like how do I tell the difference? You know, like I have things, I've always considered that I have a pretty good law of attraction. You know, like, for example, for the first time in my life when I have a decent amount of money, I've got money to put into the sanctuary, you know. Um, Can like I point out to you and everyone that everyone has a perfect law of attraction? So I don't know why you consider yours as a good law of attraction and somebody else is bad, because the reality is that all of us have a perfect law of attraction. Can, can you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I'm aware of that. So when yeah. you say you have a pretty good law of attraction, really aren't you talking about your monetary law of attraction? I'm talking about my desires being fulfilled. No, you're not talking about your desires being fulfilled because I can think of 10 desires that you currently have that are not being fulfilled. Yeah. You can think of more than that. <laughs> so can you say you've got a pretty good law of attraction with those desires? No. No. So there must be an emotional injury affecting those. Can you see that? The truth is we have, a when you say pretty good law of attraction, you have a perfect law of attraction. The areas in which you're getting your desires met, your law of attraction is based upon or pure desire mixed with often emotions 
And those things create all sorts of circumstances, which some of which feel good to you and other ones feel bad to you. Like your relationship with women isn't that hot crash hot, is it? To, yeah. No. Do you feel it is? No. No. And hasn't been for... No, it's never been all that great. Yeah. So, so in that area, your law of attraction, which is perfect, a perfect law of attraction in that area too, but your law of attraction is demonstrating to you that actually there's some, must be some addictions and emotions that need to be worked through there. But how's your law of attraction with regard to getting anything you want physically? Like in terms of buying things you want? Um, pretty good. Pretty Even good. If I don't have money, I see, still seem to, things seem, seem to happen. Everything seems to come along and you seem to get what you want. Yeah. You enjoy your life in that regard. Yeah. So you know that there's probably less you need to work on in that area. Than, than the other area of, of your relationship with women. So, like, could um, getting my desires fulfilled in a monetary sense, could that be like what you were talking about, spirits attract, uh, doing that for me rather than it being um, more God involved? Um, why did you ask that question and not the question... Um, how come I'm not getting my desires met with my relationships? <coughs> See, you've asked me a question that there can only be a good answer to. No, the and answer could be, oh, all these good things that happen to me is all the result of spirits giving me things because they have some hook into me. That's, what I, that's what's worried me. Why, why would that be worrying you and not the relationship issue? Well, I guess it would mean that I've been fooling myself. I've been in self-deception, thinking that, oh, these good things are happening. Um, uh, uh, that's God's... Um but, but Graham, you're just expressing another addiction. The addiction you currently have is you want to avoid the relationship issue. Yeah. And, and it, by bringing up a secondary issue, which is nowhere near as important to your happiness as the relationship issue, and in which you've already said you're quite happy with... So why are you worried about something you're quite happy with but you're not concerned about something that's quite distressing? Can you see? You can only be asking me the question because you're actually, you're worried about the happy thing not happening anymore. Yeah, fear of losing it. Yeah. When the thing that's unhappy, you're, it's like a mountain that we're avoiding. We're, we're going like, here's the mountain of relationship and we're skirting around the mountain relationship like this, like... And we're talking about a totally different issue that actually you're already happy with. And you've got a little bit of fear about that you might lose. Can you see that? But you're actually skirting right around this big, big mountain here of relationship. And you didn't want to ask a question about that one. Can you see how you're in an addiction even with the question? Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be better to go, all right, who knows what's happening with this abundance thing, but... My life's pretty good and I'm pretty happy with it. <laughs> right? And yes, I am afraid of losing it. So I'll write that down. I'm afraid of losing my abundance. There's, there's an emotion I need to deal with at some point. But let's focus on this bigger thing. I am desperately unhappy in my relationships with women. Right? I can't seem to be able to have a relationship with women without there being all sorts of issues come up and I can't get to my emotions about it. Let's look at that issue. And then the question becomes, well, why, why don't I want to look at that issue? What's my addiction to not looking at that issue? And can you see how your penchant for a lot of external things that you do is about avoiding the relationship issue? So the truth is that much of the, you know, the yacht and the backpack, the flying, the, all the other things that you do, a lot of it is done because you feel bad about the relationship issue not being fulfilled and these are ways in which you can get out of that a relationship out of that and feel quite happy and good about yourself as a male does that make sense mm -hmm. so there's some desire in there of feeling quite good about yourself as a male you got some things which are like some dangerous things really sometimes they they don't seem dangerous to you but they're probably more dangerous than the average fellow would continue to do aren't they and by the way, Graham straps a motor on his back and goes flying. Uh, so, so, 
So that gives you an idea that he has not much fear <laughs> when it comes to you know, being you know, a thousand metres up in the air looking down on you with just a little parachute attached to his back with a flying machine. So there's obviously not much fear in you about all those kind of things and you, and you do those kind of things to avoid relationship many times. It helps you get away with how bad you feel in this other area of your life. And that's a perfect example of how an addiction leads you to a desire that creates a life, but actually there's still this great hole in the life in another area that you ignore. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. So while I haven't answered your question, I've addressed the issue of why often you are questioning me on issues that are nothing to do with the major issue that's in your life that you feel sad about. That I'm avoiding. That you're avoiding. Yeah. Yeah. We better have a break. <laughs>